Okay, I think we'll get started and um, as more folks join, um, we'll welcome them. So um, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Visualizing Com Complexity, pr Pragmatic Approaches to Process Mapping for Public Health Departments. Um, today's presentations will provide an overview of process mapping, as well as a case study of a health department that has utilized process mapping to improve HIV programming. Uh, just a little bit about this webinar and the collaboration between NASTAD and the University of Washington Fred Hutch Center for AIDS Research. Um, this is a collaboration um, on the RAISE Hub. Um, it's funded through NIH. And the aim of this initiative is to support and provide technical assistance to ending the HIV epidemic or EHE phase one um, jurisdictions. You can learn more about NASTAD's EHE work at our microsite, as well as the work of the RACE Hub um, at this uh, website. And I will put the links for both of those in the chat in a minute. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce our next present our presenters for today but uh just to give you all a heads up we have another webinar on may the 17th um, and i will also put the registration link for that in the chat in a second um so today our uh, presenters are dr ariana means um, who is a assistant uh, professor of global health at the university of washington Dr. Means focuses on generating operational evidence needed to improve the delivery of routine primary health care programs in low and middle income countries, both within health facilities and in communities. Um, she currently leads several implementation science projects and also teaches the Fundamentals of Implementation Science course, uh, which provides training to over 200 implementation scientists around the world. Um, and her area of expertise is integrating evaluation of impl implementation outcomes into clinically oriented research to ensure that findings translate into evidence needed to inform policy and guidelines. And our second presenter is Dr. Christine Kosrapur, who is an assistant professor of epidemiology at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Uh, her work involves both research and applied epidemiology in the field of HIV and STI prevention. Her research focuses on behavioral risks for HIV and STI infection, the epidemi epidemiology of rectal chlamydia among men and women, and the implementation of PrEP and HIV care engagement programs in the southern U.S. Um, she's worked with over 20 state and local health departments to provide expertise and guidance on the implementation and evaluation of HIV STI public health programs. And so I will now um, turn it over to Dr. Means to uh, start off our first presentation. Thanks, Krupa. Thanks. And it's so great to see so many people joining us. I'm going to share my screen. And can you see my slides? All righty. Um, as Krupa mentioned, my name is Ariana Rubin Means, and I'm an assistant professor in the Implementation Science Corps uh, at the Center for AIDS Research here at the University of Washington. And along with my colleague, Christine Kosrapur, um, we're really pleased to present on behalf of the RAISE Hub. So uh, Krupa's already given a great introduction to RAISE. Um, RAISE is National Institutes of Health Funded Supplement to the University of Washington, Fred Hutch CIFAR. You can see um, our leadership group uh, here on the slide. And our group works to advance the contribution of implementation science towards ending the HIV epidemic, the EHE initiative, by providing technical assistance to NIH-supported EHE projects and um, also through our really exciting work with NASTAD. And through this work and um, our support to health departments specifically, our goal is really to advance implementation science research agendas in EHE jurisdictions. And one way that we do that is through developing these webinars, which are designed specifically for health departments, um, including today's webinar on process mapping. So I'm gonna dive in. Feel free to put questions in the chat. We might wait to address uh, many of the questions until uh, the end of this session, but we've reserved some time at the end for questions and discussion. So starting from the very beginning, backing up from process mapping for a second, um, when we talk about processes, we're talking about 
understanding a discrete practice or a set of activities or steps that result in accomplishing a really specific organizational goal. So um, I'd like to invite all of you to just pause for a second and think about a process in your own work or in your own organization that is complex. Maybe it's confusing. Maybe it's something that people often misinterpret from each other. It could be something that's just really challenging to implement and you find a lot of hiccups um, with this process. Or you can also think about a process that you're hoping to launch soon, maybe a new activity, a new study, a new program that's gonna be launching. So if you can name that process, what would you name that process? Just take a second to think about it, maybe even write it down if you like. And I would like to invite you to hold that process in the back of your mind during the rest of this webinar to really think about how the, all the process mapping steps that we'll be talking about today may or may not apply to that process. So here's just a few examples of processes that I know um, a number of people on this webinar today work on. Things like linking people with newly diagnosed HIV infections with treatment, conducting rapid initiation of PrEP via PrEP navigators, establishing mobile syringe services programs, implementing routine HIV testing within emergency departments, integrating PrEP screening and referral into prenatal services. These are all examples of processes that we implement or we study. So why would we wanna actually map processes like these? Uh, well, process maps are a quality improvement tool. They can be used to visualize how healthcare, public health services, and other complex processes are actually delivered. And the goal is really to depict this step-by-step um, -step flow. So this sometimes includes recording things like the timing of activities in that process, handoffs that occur during the process, other important outputs that it's helpful to visualize or measure and study across that cascade of process activities. And process mapping can support quality improvement projects in public health because they engage stakeholders to create a shared understanding of the systems that they're trying to change. So process mapping is inherently a really participatory activity in that way. And, um, and that's because process mapping helps create this kind of shared understanding of existing systems before anyone in that system actually tries to test any improvement strategy. So it's really a consensus building activity. And of course, when we talk about quality improvement, we're often referring to principles like lean thinking and Six Sigma, which some of you might've heard about before. These are basically um, management principles that are built out of the business world that aim to develop um, kind of efficient processes to yield basically a bigger bottom line. But they've been adapted for healthcare and also for public health as a way to try to understand inefficiencies and waste in service delivery and identify opportunities to improve delivery and make greater value for the people who are involved, be it health workers, patients, or even the general public. So today we are adapting these principles to think about how process mapping can be deployed in a really pragmatic way for public health implementation. So let's look at a high level example of a flow diagram that was generated during process mapping. And then we'll talk about the specifics of how to do something like this. So this is from a paper uh, by researchers in the UK who were trying to increase the frequency with which patients with radiologically diagnosed community acquired pneumonia were offered HIV tests. And this required them to first start by mapping the current flow of activities, starting with patients who are entering the emergency department or who were uh, referred by an admitting team, and then map where those patients were interacting with different health personnel along this cascade of care. And so the researchers convened a multidisciplinary team of people who work along this process to meet and agree upon what the process looks like, which is what you can see here. And then they use this map to develop seven interventions that they tested during quality improvement cycles. So for example, they tested um, an approach where respiratory infection nurses directly offered HIV tests to patients early in their care. 
which allowed the process to become more efficient. So here, a process map allowed this team to visualize um, waste or redundancy in their current implementation process, and then it allowed them to envision and even test a more efficient system, all kind of uh, predicated upon this initial flowchart. So as you can see in that example, process mapping really intends to visualize the phases of an activity by displaying the procedures that are needed to implement the activity in an accessible and very step-by-step -step format. And it does so by using these universal shapes or symbols in a flow diagram. And these symbols are used to show uh, beginning and end points of a process, decision points and steps along the way. And we'll talk about uh, more about those symbols and shapes in a, in a minute. So you can use a very simple flow diagram for process mapping, but depending upon your objective, that initial objective that you thought about at the beginning, you can also add uh, more detail to show things like the personnel who are involved in the process, departments that are involved in the process, different geographic levels, or really any strata of interest that you think is relevant to the initial objective uh, for the mapping. So in this way, process mapping is really helpful because it can support this internal and external communication, like uh, process maps can form the basis of things like standard operating procedures or SOPs. Um, they can be used within training materials. They can be used for external communication to uh, funders or community partners or really any kind of communication tool. And what's really important about process mapping, what makes them valuable is that they are fact-based. They're not subjective. They are fact-based reflections of reality. Um, and that highlights the importance of bringing together people with various perspectives to participate in process mapping. That's important because everyone's positionality clouds their perception to some extent of what the reality of a process is. And so having a diversity of experiences involved in the process mapping um, is a real asset. And we'll talk about that more in a few minutes too. So why exactly are process maps helpful? I've already mentioned quite a number of reasons, um, but first, they can help us understand current systems. They can help describe a process's current state or an ideal future state, and they can bring visibility to that process that might otherwise be misunderstood. Process maps can inform the current scope, design, or evaluation of an implementation process. So that means that they can do things like uncover areas of inefficiency, they can identify in have opportunities for improvement, like in the example I just showed. They can be used as a precursor for value stream mapping or quality improvement, which I'll briefly talk about later, but it's not the focus of what we're talking about today. And they can be used to disseminate information about implementation processes, like I just mentioned, to community partners or to funders. And lastly, and very importantly, my favorite part about process maps is that they can promote co-production and knowledge exchange, both within a team and across a team. So this facilitates collaboration and teamwork. It can help align stakeholders with different perspectives. And it can be really motivating to people who are involved in process mapping because they're engaged in co-creating change actions that affect their own work. And it can encourage a culture of ownership and responsibilities uh, for the systems that people are working on. So I'd like to invite you again to um, think for a second if any of these rationale for doing process mapping resonate with you, and specifically about that process that you thought about um, from your own work at the beginning. So why do you think process mapping of that specific activity could help to improve your organization's work? Will it help people understand the current system, to identify opportunities to evaluate or improve implementation, to support the co-production and knowledge exchange within teams? Um, take that and, and carry it forward with you, hopefully outside of this webinar. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that process mapping is actually helpful. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about how to actually do process mapping. And we're going to talk about six key steps, including first, identifying the objective of process mapping, 
Second, preparing for mapping. Third, collecting the data. And we'll talk about a few different options for collecting process mapping data. Fourth, visualizing the data. And again, we'll talk about a few different options. Fifth, validating the maps using member checking. And six, evaluating or interrogating the maps. So the first step, identifying the objective is essential. So just like how when you establish a strong research question prior to beginning a study, establishing a really clear process mapping objective is important because it helps ensure that the entire effort is feasible and, um, and will be effective. So you wanna take the time from the very beginning to work with your colleagues to create a really clear objective. So for example, something like mapping HIV services is way too broad. Instead, you wanna think about, are you mapping the process of uh, clients getting PrEP referrals within a specific organization? Or are you mapping the process of partner notification services? You wanna state it really clearly. Next, you want to establish the boundaries of the process so that you're only collecting information that's actually really necessary to that process. So for example, are you starting the process at a point at which a patient arrives at a clinic? Or are you starting to think about that process at the point at which patient has data that are recorded within a specific database that sets off a cascade of activities? And so you wanna decide from the onset and ideally write that within some written document that's maintained by your team, how detailed you plan to be. So will you just be naming the activities or will you be naming the individuals, the locations, the material resources that are needed to implement each activity? You also want to decide whose perspective you'll be capturing. Will you be capturing what, what the process looks like from the perspective of patients or clients? Or will you be thinking more about the perspective of providers or organizations? Or will you try to um, kind of meld the two together? Sometimes melding of perspectives works, and sometimes it's challenging. It depends on your initial objective. So for example, let's say you have an activity on a map from a patient perspective where you add a step that's where the patient has to walk 10 minutes to get from a clinic to a pharmacy to pick up their meds. That might reflect some inefficiencies from the perspective of the patient, but it's not really any wasted time for the clinic as they're doing other services, they're seeing other patients over that 10 minute time period. So think carefully about the perspective that you're using. And then lastly, you need to decide how granular to make each step. So for example, would you specify one step to be um, patient check-ins or would you make that activity more detailed? Like the patient checks in and then presents their insurance card, and then as another step, the patient goes to sit in the waiting room until their name is called. And the reason why it's really important to think from the very beginning before you start any data collection about how granular you wanna be is because you wanna maintain that same level of detail throughout the map as you describe activities um, and put them in there. And I've alluded to this already, but an Absolutely essential part of identifying the objective is deciding a priori if you're mapping the flow of activities as they're currently conducted in the organization or if you're mapping the ideal flow of activities as you would like for them to be implemented. Usually, in fact, almost always, it's the first that you map activities as they are now. The exception might be if you're establishing a workflow for the first time and you can start with what you think the ideal is and then iterate from there. Um, sometimes you'll do both as part of a project to see where you are and what needs to change to get to where you're going, but usually it's the first. All right, so you've identified your objective. Next, you start preparing for the mapping. And you can start by first clearly documenting the objective and the plan that you've just come up with, as I just talked about. It's always helpful to have a resource like that to return to, especially if there starts to be any scope drift. Second, you want to make sure that you allow for sufficient time to do the mapping. And you should have at least an, at least a couple hours, ideally half a day, depending upon who you're engaging with in the mapping, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But speeding through process mapping usually results in some activities being left off. So you wanna make sure that you leave enough time. Third, you wanna ensure that the right people are involved and that they have time to participate. So process maps 
they reflect a collective intelligence of everybody who's involved. So it's important to invite people from across the implementation cascade to participate and lend their experiences and expertise, uh, especially frontline staff. It's also important that participants have the background they need to participate in mapping. So you might consider training them um, on process mapping before you start the activity, like just a quick introduction to the rationale for process mapping. And then it's time to gather the materials. So you can start to think about where you'll be doing the process mapping. Thinking about, is it in a break room with a bare wall? Is it in a classroom with a whiteboard? And what materials you'll need? Um, Regardless, I think sticky notes or post-it notes are a really helpful tool to, to use in this process. They can easily move around as you work in this kind of um, process of envisioning what a workflow looks like. You can even use sticky notes uh, to show different strata of interest, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, I've literally flown around the world with multi seven or eight colors of sticky notes in my luggage <laughs> for process mapping. So then it's time for data collection. And you wanna start by brainstorming a list of all of the activities that are implemented during your process of interest and you write them down. You don't need to necessarily brainstorm them in sequence, although doing so can be helpful because it helps you be sure not to forget something. But when you're working in a group or when you're collecting these data, you the facilitator should use probes like asking, okay, what happens next? Or does anything need to happen before this takes place to help make sure that no activities are missed as you're making this list? And you can write down each activity in a sticky note and then put them all over the wall, put them all over the whiteboard, on a table, whatever surface you have. And when you think you've created this full list and you're ready, you can start to move those activities around to be in the order in which they occur during real world implementation. Personally, if I'm not doing mapping on a whiteboard, I'll start to attach the sticky notes to a piece of flip chart paper at this point. And you can keep moving the sticky notes around as you discuss and as you brainstorm until you've reached some kind of consensus about what this flow looks like. And then you can start to draw arrows between the sticky notes to demonstrate the flow between these activities. And as you do so, you can start to layer in more nuance, like decisions that need to be made from going from one activity to another, such as, um, does the person have a positive pregnancy test? Yes, no. If yes, go to this activity. If no, go to this activity. And you can go ahead and record those additional details either in the map or in a written document. And here's two examples from my own work about what this process can look like. And you can see the maps are really messy to start with. These data can be collected in a variety of ways. They can be collected using direct observation, by looking at um, electronic health records, at looking at documents. But the most common ways, and the ways that I'm gonna talk about now, um, are one-on-one -on -one interviews with people who are involved in the process, and group workshops or multidisciplinary meetings of people who are involved. Um, and personally, I love mapping as a group because people have these really dynamic conversations. They're building off of one another's ideas. They're spitballing. They're challenging each other. And it's a really fruitful process. So option one of data collection, um, when you're collecting these data via one-on-one -on -one interviews, you can start by showing people either a draft flowchart that they can respond to, or you can create a flowchart together. And this depends a bit on how well the kind of basic flow is already known. Um, you can collect data uh, with one-on-one -on -one and face like face-to-face -face interviews, but you can also do remote interviews or even surveys. Um, although you might want to be careful about, you know, do a lot of checks on data quality if you're not face-to-face -face having these conversations. So an advantage of one-to-one -one data collection is that you have kind of like an individual interview. You have the opportunity to learn from one person, really get an in-depth look at their engagement and their experiences with the process. On the other hand, a series of individual meetings can be more time consuming than a workshop. And you also have to figure out how to interpret independently, potentially conflicting accounts of implementation that you've learned about by speaking to different uh, individuals separately. The other option, again, is a brainstorming session or a workshop where you have lots of stakeholders doing the process mapping together at the same time. 
Just like for the one-on-one -on -one interviews, you can start by showing a draft flowchart or you can create the flowchart together. And since there's more people to manage a facilitator guide or some kind of standard operating procedure is useful in running this type of workshop. Uh, a pro of collecting data via workshop is that uh, discussion amongst participants can lead to a lot like richer detail and provide the opportunity for people to reach consensus together rather than you as a data collector needing to kind of piece together the data later and make decisions separate from the participants. This is important too because um, uh, group process mapping can build trust and camaraderie. It's not just about drawing the chart. It's also an opportunity to learn about other people's workflows, which can build kind of empathy and camaraderie within a team. The con is that just like a focus group, uh, a single dominant individual or group of individuals can sometimes affect the data collected, particularly if they drown out the experiences or perspectives of others. So while you wanna have a multidisciplinary group, you also wanna think about the power uh, dynamics within the group that's participating. The next step is to visualize the data. Um, you've already listed all the steps in implementation, you've drawn these arrows, and now you wanna take it from the sticky notes and turn it into a more nuanced uh, digital version of the map. There's a lot of softwares out there that can help you do that. Personally, I like Lucidchart. I find it the, the easiest to use. And you can start by using the set of standardized symbols that you can see on the right side of the screen. Um, you don't need to use all the symbols, um, but these are some of the more kind of standardized ones. Activity steps, as you can see here, are represented by a rectangle. Usually you just have one arrow coming out of an activity, um, but you can show more, you can have more than one arrow coming out of a decision, which is usually indicated by a diamond. For example, you might have one arrow that's yes and one arrow that's no. I do wanna stress though, that there is no like single right way to draw a flow chart um, to do process mapping. The right way is the way that's the most understandable and the most helpful to everybody who's involved. So here's an example of what this could look like. Um, this is a simple process of waking up in the morning. The beginning and the end are indicated by these circles on either side. And then we have activities like the alarm ringing are in these rectangles. And we face this decision after the alarm rings. Um, are we ready to face the world? <laughs> and if yes, then we get out of bed and we end the flow. If no, we hit snooze, we stare at the ceiling for five minutes, and this part of the flow could unfortunately just continue in perpetuity. <laughs> Next, we would need to make a flow chart on how to make a cup of coffee. So as I mentioned, uh, those are some basic symbols, but there are more complex symbols that we could add to our flow charts as well. So we could add symbols for key data points that need to be um, uh, collected in the process or used in the process, delays that are persistent or perhaps necessary, like the amount of time it takes to run a lab test before another activity can happen. We can add symbols for documents that need to be consulted or created at certain parts of a flow. So lots of, um, lots of kind of degrees to which you can add complexity to your flowchart. And there's even more complexity that could be added. So one way of showing additional detail is by doing something called adding swim lanes, sometimes known as matrices. They allow us to organize our process maps, not just by kind of the sequence of activities, but also by other strata of interest, like departments, organizations, individual people who are responsible for an activity, et cetera. And this type of process map highlights like different roles and how different roles interact with each other. So it's great when you're training new staff it's great for clarifying roles when there's confusion or identifying inefficiencies or redundancies. This is kind of a playful example of a pizza place making pizzas. They organize swim lanes by input as they're cooking pizzas. And you can see these kind of potential inefficiencies in the process where they keep going back and forth to the storage area, that row with navy blue square as navy blue rectangles. So it seems like because they've made these swim lanes, we can see there might be opportunities to build efficiencies in their movement between these different spots in the pizza place. 
Here's an example from my work um, using swim lanes. Unfortunately, it's not about pizza. And here we have both horizontal swim lanes and vertical swim lanes. Um, the vertical swim lanes show the parts of the clinic that the activity is taking place in. The horizontal ones are showing the specific health worker who's implementing the activity. And I know it's hard to see on here, but really the main message is that it helped us understand both role clarification when we're looking at, okay, which activities are exactly are assigned to which individual, but it also helped us see inefficiencies where sometimes patients are having to bop back and forth to different areas of a clinic. And then I just wanted to mention that you can also show complexity in your process by using colors. So for example, in this map, we categorize steps um, by types of activity, like we have planning activities in one color, training activities in another color. We even use colors to show when we added activities to this map over time because we are iteratively updating it throughout implementation. You can see that we bolded the outline of activities that were added um, over time. So you can get kind of creative with colors, bolding, other ways to kind of communicate what you need to for your specific objective. So you've built your flow charts, you've digitized your maps. You wanna make sure that before you brush your hands and say you're done, that you validate them, ideally through a process of member checking. So member checking is when data interpretations and conclusions are validated by members of the groups from whom the data were originally collected. So here you return to the participants, ideally some of the people who engaged in the original process mapping, to learn how accurately this, visual, this visualization actually reflects their input, and then you can make further tweaks as necessary. Because sometimes people only like know it when they see it, meaning once they see the map, they're like, oh, that's actually not what I meant. Switch these activities around, or I don't do that, you do that. This can be particularly important if you collected the data one-on-one -on -one as opposed to within a group. Um, so it's really essential that everyone has the opportunity to check how you interpreted that one-on-one -on -one feedback and aggregated it together. And ideally, member checking is iterative. After each time you update the process map, you can bring it back to the group, get their approval, and ensure that it's really valid. After you feel confident that your map is valid, then you can evaluate it and really interrogate it as a group. So these conversations probably already started at the very beginning when people started brainstorming the list of activities during data collection. But you can use the map to identify points of inefficiency, confusion, or waste. You can ask questions like, are people doing the same work in different ways? Are steps repeated? Are they out of sequence? Are there steps that don't add value? Are there steps where there's often delays? How are the handoffs between these steps going? Are they smooth? Are there bottlenecks or inefficiencies? You can also uh, start to learn a bit about why team members perceive activities differently or in different flow. So is there some sort of miscommunication that can be rectified? Or is there some sort of internal confusion about what procedures are supposed to be taking place? And by having these sorts of conversations, it becomes clear what the implementation challenges are and where there might be opportunities to improve. And like I mentioned earlier, your team can take it a step further by engaging in some sort of active quality improvement. Quality improvement helps you see if um, altering the process in some sort of discrete specific way helps improve a targeted outcome. So something like the plan, do, study, act cycle would be helpful here. This is not a necessary step of process mapping, but it's a really helpful application of all the work that's gone into process mapping. Another optional add-on um, is value stream maps. Again, we're not gonna talk about that too much here, um, but I do wanna mention them as a, another kind of lean management tool that helps you extend your process map by essentially layering on important quantitative data onto a flow diagram, like the time needed to complete a process from a provider perspective or from a client perspective, the number of staff involved in each step, et cetera. You can see in this value stream map, they quantified time spent on different steps uh, for a clinic visit for people who are living with HIV who are recently hospitalized in South Africa. I'm not gonna talk about them in further detail, but they're very cool. 
And I want to highlight them again as kind of a natural extension of process maps for anyone here who wants to dig deeper. So process maps are really helpful, and there are also some really common challenges. First, they take time. You have to pull people away from their jobs and their job responsibilities to do process mapping. Sometimes people are resistant to share how things actually work. They really want to share how things are supposed to work. Um, like when you imagine waking up in the morning, you, you may not confess to all the snoozing you did. But it's important to make a psychologically safe environment where people can share just how messy things are in reality so that there's opportunities to address them. Implementation is not static, so if you're updating these maps over time, you want to make sure that you demarcate, uh, record those adaptations to whatever degree you can. That's particularly helpful if personnel evolve or if there's lost institutional memory in the future. And then last, process maps just, they can't reflect all the contextual determinants that affect implementation. So if you doing things like pairing process maps with qualitative data can really help paint a fuller picture of the context. So that's a bit about how to build process maps. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Christine, who's going to provide a real life example of doing process mapping in action. Thanks so much, Ariana. I wish I had heard that lecture before I had tried this myself. So I'll be talking about um, just an example of process mapping, uh, which was a collaboration between the Mississippi State Department of Health and our team at the University of Washington. Next slide. So I'd just like to start with some acknowledgments. So this work was really done by the team at the Mississippi State Department of Health um, listed here. Um, most of the folks on this list have um, le left the health department, though I'm pleased that I uh, saw Cassandra Neal in the, in the audience here. Um, and then from the UW uh, side, uh, a shout out to Tigran Navunjan and Matt Golden as well. Next slide, please. So the process mapping I'll be talking about was part of um, uh, funding CDC PS 15, 15, 11, which some of you may have received. And this was a CDC funding that went to the Mississippi State Department of Health and um, the UW team were subcontractors on this. And it was a collaboration to implement and evaluate the integration of new HIV related activities into MSDH's STD partner services program. And there were three main components of the work. The first was to evaluate the utility of STD partner services for syphilis and gonorrhea to increase HIV testing and case finding. Next, to integrate HIV care re-engagement into STD partner services to promote viral suppression. And third, to integrate PrEP referrals into STD partner services to link individuals at high risk for HIV into PrEP care. And although we did end up doing process mapping for all three of these activities, I'm really just gonna talk about or, or focus on the motivation for the second aim here. Next slide, please. And again. So starting for, with, with this entire sort of suite of activities and all of these aims, when we were developing the protocol uh, for these new activities, we really took what I would consider to be a traditional or status quo approach to developing the protocol. And that was that supervisors of each team at MSDH who were involved in these activities met to develop the protocol. It was workshopped over several weeks and months. And then the final protocol was circulated to all teams and supervisors described pr the project during their routine meetings. So for example, the DIS supervisor described the project to the DIS team. And then as different activities were rolled out, adaptions were made to sort of optimize the integration of activities into existing work. And this relied uh, mostly on sort of passive reporting from staff working on the project. If something wasn't working, they would sort of make tweaks to it, but it was not really a collective effort to, to sort of improve the implementation. Next slide, please. So I mentioned I was gonna talk specifically about one of these aims and that's to integrate HIV care re-engagement into STD partner services to promote viral suppression. This was started in June of 2017 and the crux or starting point of this was a, was a new activity and that was to match HIV and STD surveillance data to identify people living with HIV who were newly diagnosed with an STI. Next slide, please. And here's a high level overview of that particular aim. So we did this data merge between HIV and STD surveillance data to identify people living with HIV who were living in the Jackson area, 
who had been diagnosed with gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis within the past 14 days, and who we categorized as being out of care, which were people who were whose most recent viral load was over a thousand copies per mil, or they had no viral load reported in the last year, and that was from EHARS data. Once these individuals were identified, this list of folks was, was passed over to DIS. And the DIS were to contact cases to discuss their HIV care status, conduct what was called an acuity assessment, and make an appointment um, or provider referral to an HIV care provider. And this was in addition to the DIS's standard partner services, STD partner services activities that they did. They were sort of integrating this HIV care engagement into STD partner services. Later, the DIS would recontact those individuals who didn't attend the HIV care appointment and, and work with, with uh, clients to reschedule those. And then finally, we monitored this activity um, and looked at, at sort of its success um, as a whether referred cases were virally suppressed six months after initial contact by the DIS. Next slide, please. So the results of that evaluation showed that during about a one year period, there was 362 people living with HIV who had an STD diagnosed that were identified through the HIV and STD surveillance match. Next slide, please, or next click. And of those 362 people, 93 or 25% were categorized as out of care according to HIV surveillance data. And 86 or 92% uh, were folks who had a most recent viral load greater than 1,000. 11% had no viral load in the year prior to their HIV, STD diagnosis, excuse me. And, and one more click, uh, three had both, had a viral load over 1,000 and no viral load in the year prior to their STD diagnosis. So it was really these 93 individuals that were newly diagnosed with an STI that we were, um, that we were working with. Next click, please. And of these 93 individuals who were categorized as out of care, uh, 65 or 70% were assigned to DIS for investigation. Next. And only 37% were referred to care. Next. And of the 24 people who were referred to care, 21 attended their referral appointment. Next. And of those who were referred to HIV care, 50% were virally suppressed within six months. Click. Please. And so when looking at this sort of continuum, we noted some clear gaps in how, uh, how this was being executed. So ideally, of the 93 people who were identified by the surveillance merge as being out of care, all of them should have been assigned to DIS for investigation. And and of those that were assigned to DIS for investigation, all or nearly all should have been referred to HIV care. Um, again, these were people or, or disposed accor accordingly. So these were people who had been identified as being um, out of care. So uh, click please. So our takeaway was really that the implementation of the program was not working as intended. And in terms of evaluating the impact of the program, um, it was hard to do so knowing that it wasn't exactly being implemented uh, the, way that, the way that we had intended. Next slide, please. And so that really brought us to process mapping as a method to sort of try to really improve the process. One more click, please. And this is a slide that Ariana showed earlier, and I'm just highlighting with yellow stars um, some of the reasons that for this particular situation, process mapping was really helpful. So we really did want to describe sort of the current state of what was going on and bring visibility to this process. And third star, we wanted to identify opportunities for improvement. So we knew some things, some things weren't working as well as intended and we wanted to figure out where the process could be improved. And finally, um, we really felt that this was an opportunity for, to facilitate collaboration and, and teamwork and allow people to feel a sense of ownership over their role in this particular a set of activities. Next slide, please. So our approach was unfortunately not quite as step-by-step um, -step as Ariana outlined, uh, but we did our best. So we invited anyone who touched any part of the program to participate in this process. And that ultimately included some of the same people who were involved in the original protocol development, but mostly not. Again, we took sort of a traditional, I would say status quo approach to protocol development, 
with mostly supervisors sort of working on the protocol. But here we were um, not necessarily working with supervisors. We were in a big conference room at the health department um, with large sheets of paper and markers. Post-it notes would have been much better in retrospect because there was a lot of scratching out, um, but we worked with what we had. Um, and the facilitators were um, myself and Tigran, the UW team, um, and we had been extremely involved in the integration and evaluation of the activities and really familiar with um, the whole process, which I think helped with facilitation of being able to probe. Um, and this did take several hours. Next slide, please. So we started really at step one, and Ariana mentioned um, not necessarily having to do activities in sequence. We tried to do things in sequence. Um, and ultimately lots of scratching out when we realized we had missed steps. So again, post-its probably would have been better. Um, we had the person who was responsible sort of for each activity or each step in the process describe what they do. And we additionally saw this as an opportunity to probe for specific barriers and facilitators at each step, which you'll see we delineated directly at the, on the maps um, themselves. Uh, people warmed up after a while and were more forthcoming about challenges and what they needed from others in the room to make their individual set of activities easier. It did take a little um, while, I think, to get warmed up um, with this process. Next slide, please. So our first iteration, unfortunately, this was back in 2017, and I, I thought I had taken pictures, but I can't find them. So it was markers scratching out on paper, and it was very messy. Next slide. And then Tigran, I'm um, using one of the softwares that Ariana mentioned, he used um, Draw.io, um, put together this in electronic format. Here we've delineated the barriers and facilitators in red and green respectively. And then next slide, we sort of went back to the group and then wanted to clean it up using some more um, colors and, and making things a little bit more clear. Um, and this was the, the most clear version. So essentially, I'm not gonna go through all of this in detail, but just to walk through some of the steps, starting in the upper left-hand corner with these two data systems being merged. And we have in parentheses, the initials of the person who was responsible for each step, just to help us keep track of that. So we have sort of running the code to merge these data systems, and then someone manually checking something, giving a list to someone else, um, opening up a field record and so on and so forth. So you can see sort of how detailed each of these um, steps are really because we felt like we needed to get to that level of detail in order to really be able to delineate the barriers and facilitator and figure out how to make this process, um, how to optimize the process. You'll note here, and I'll come back to this later, um, on the bottom half of this process map, there's not a lot of barriers and facilitators um, recorded, and I'll come back to that in a second. Next slide. Just high level, these are the other process maps that we created for the other two aims as part of this project. Um, again, sort of these step-by-step -step processes to really get at every single step in this process and figure out how we can make it, how we can make it better. Next slide. So in terms of outcomes of this, I think we were by doing the process mapping, it allowed us to really hone in and some of the barriers at each step to help improve the program. Again, we were doing this at a, at a point where we had already, the activities had already been you know, kicked off and were integrated into the work. So we were starting with um, what had been going on for a while. And so we really felt like it was helpful to at that point, figure out what we were doing and where the barriers um, were that we could hopefully address. I think ultimately people who were involved felt more of a sense of ownership um, of their role in the program once it was clear where they fit in and also that their work was central to the success of the program. And I mentioned sort of the bottom of that process map I showed um, was a little bit lean in terms of barriers and facilitators. One of the things we did not do well was um, successfully engage individual DIS in working on these process maps. Um, and that was for a variety of reasons, but ultimately what we ended up doing, so this was a group workshop, which was one of the methods Ariana mentioned, but what we ended up doing was later doing individual interviews and focus groups with DIS um, to, to better understand their role in these processes and how things could be tweaked to improve the work that they were doing and to optimize the process. So we did it maybe a little bit 
I don't know, I would say a little bit backwards, but it wasn't until we did the group workshop and figured out that we needed a different approach to engage other voices. Um, and then we did sort of step two of this with these um, individual interviews. Next slide. So that's sort of the case study that we wanted to share. These are references and resources um, and uh, for process mapping. And so you're obviously free to take a look at these and um, reach out to our team anytime if you have questions about, um, about how, how these process mapping activities work. So thank you for your attention. Um, and I think there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Great. Um, thank you to Ariana and Christine for that great presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Others feel free to add some if you have them. Um, so the first is, uh, what tool would you all recommend using to create the final flowchart? Word, Canva, is there other softwares? Thanks. Yes. Um, essentially, you can use PowerPoint. You can use Word. The issue is with those is that the maps can often be very big and they can get bigger and bigger and bigger. And sometimes when you start adding things and then they get unwieldy in Word or PowerPoint. So some of the programs, I think I mentioned some in a few slides um, earlier, like Lucidchart or Draw.io, like Christine mentioned, those are really helpful because as you kind of add an activity or adjust, it all kind of like reconfigures to be um, like reconnect and spread out and not get all jumbly. Like you'd have to kind of manually change it in PowerPoint. Personally, I love Lucidchart. That's my favorite though. Yeah, Lucidchart is great. Um, so our second question is asking about data collection methods where you might follow a pathway instead of having interviews or focus groups. So something more along the lines of a patient journey. Could this also be used for process mapping? Yeah, I can take that. And then Christine looks like you might have something to add too. Yeah. So basically patient journeys are a type of process mapping. They are um, Earlier, I mentioned the perspective is important. So patient journeys are basically process mapping from the perspective of patients, um, where you think about all their touch points in a system. Sometimes they start earlier um, than you would think about. So they start, they think about things like, what's the process of the patient scheduling an appointment, of getting to a clinic, of walking into the clinic, of following up afterwards. Um, so you are really intentional with where you think about things starting and ending and whose perspective you're using. You can collect the data in the same way. You can have engage a group of patients to talk about their journeys. You can talk to patients one-on-one -on -one to talk about their journeys, or you can do things like observation um, or even kind of um, uh, like mock patients who like go through a flow as well and provide information. So lots of ways you can look at electro electronic health records, although there's some information that's lost about kind of um, nuance in patient journeys, particularly before or after they enter a health facility. So kind of the same flexibility and types of data you collect. You can talk to them in groups, you can talk to them in individuals, but it's really kind of the perspective and level of detail that helps paint the picture of the patient journey. What do you think, Christine? Yeah, I was just going to give from the same example I showed, and I didn't have time to talk about it, but one additional thing we did was we sort of did um, sort of patient journeys, but it was for um, uh, people diagnosed with an STD who were being contacted by the health department for partner services, STD partner services. And we actually had pieces of paper um, that sort of represented the case. And we would sort of start a piece of paper with that person's sort of case ID number um, sort of at the first step when the when the um, electronic lab report came through and that person at the health department who first sort of touched that lab report would sort of start it and say that they sort of worked on the case from you know 859 to 902 or whatever and then would actually the piece of paper would physically go to the next person um, who was working it whoever that was and so it sort of make its way through like the data team and then end up um, like at the DIS supervisor's desk who would assign it to someone and then the DIS would ultimately record all the touch points they had with the person. So we followed the person basically as a piece of paper um, and we did that sort of to figure out more for this it was more of a time efficiency thing. We were trying to figure out how long it took someone, a client essentially to work their way through partner services um, 
but it was a way of of doing it um, sort of internally with the with the pieces of paper. Um, anecdotally, I don't think any of the health department staff liked doing it. I think it was really annoying. We only did it for uh, like two weeks, but it's a lot of people going through partner services every couple of weeks. So it turned out to be a lot of different people. Um, but that's just one one other method of doing sort of patient tracking, patient flow. Yeah. Great. So we got a third question in asking about the universality of flowchart symbols. Um, and are these typically the same across UN agencies, WHO, and, and other entities? Um, the core set that I first showed are pretty universal, the rectangle, the diamond, the arrow. Um, we st start to see a little bit more heterogeneity in some of those like additional symbols of complexity, like documents and data delays. For the most part, for the most part, they're pretty universal, although I, sh I can't say definitively that they're exactly what the UN or WHO use. We only have about one minute left. Um, so I just want to say thank you to all of our speakers today and thank you for everyone who attended. We will be um, posting the recording of this on our YouTube site, which I'm going to add to the chat right now. Um, you can also find previous recordings of previous webinars there as well. And uh, our next webinar is, as Krupa said, May 17th. So if you haven't registered, please do. And uh, we look forward to engaging in more conversations.